wonderful location. A little rainier up in uh, the northern part of the state, thankfully. So we'll have plenty of water for you this summer. Um, so I was asked to give you an update on uh, both PBC and PSC. And so I will be uh, kind of splitting the talk into two different, I'm assuming there's, oh, here we go, forward and reverse. That's easy. To, to two different sections, both PBC and PSE, and really hitting on the highlights of what's new and, and maybe controversial in these two diseases. Uh, so in PBC, I want to uh, focus on diagnosis, specifically talking about AMA-negative PBC and this overlap syndrome with autoimmune hepatitis. I think there's some little nuances there that uh, 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 warrant some highlighting. Talk about defining response to therapy and what are the options for our patients that don't respond well to URSO and what do we mean by that and what are the, the second line therapies we have available and which ones may we have in the future. And then switching on to PSC, we'll talk also about diagnosis and there treatment is really the big unmet need that we have in that disease. Um, uh, but whether we should use URSO or, or other things uh, we can discuss and then also something that we're dealing with with these patients is whether we should be doing surveillance, how we should be doing it. And I don't know that I have any answers for that, but we'll discuss it as well. So first of all, just recently, uh, a new set of practice guidelines were published by the AASLD, and this is an update from about 10 years ago. Uh, and this is actually a practice guidance, which is somewhat different than a guideline in that it doesn't involve a systematic review. So it doesn't have the level of evidence behind it necessarily, but it allows for a more rapid uh, update of the guidance uh, and is rather practical, I would say, in terms of um, what it advocates. And one of the major changes here, has, uh, perhaps maybe even a minor change, I would say, is uh, the diagnosis of PBC. So in the past, we typically would make our diagnosis of PBC when a patient presented with an elevated alkaline phosphatase for which we were sure it was coming from the liver, there was no biliary obstruction, um, and then they would require one of two other criteria, and that would be either a positive serum antimitochondrial antibody, or if that was negative, uh, a liver biopsy that was consistent with the features of PBC. Uh, we now have uh, very strong evidence, and it's recommended that in those cases where the AMA is negative, we can substitute um, PBC-specific antinuclear antibodies uh, specifically GP210 and SP100. And so we can avoid doing a liver biopsy in those patients that are AMA negative but have those PBC-specific antinuclear antibodies. And so our diagnostic algorithm would look like this. There's some, a patient presents with elevated alkaline phosphatase, no biliary obstruction, and we can get both an anti-mitochondrial uh, antibody as well as an antinuclear antibody. If the AMA is positive, then as usual, we would have the diagnosis of PBC clinched. If, it's, if they're AMA negative but ANA positive, we could then look for these PBC-specific antinuclear antibodies. And if one of those are positive, we have the diagnosis of PBC. If both the AMA and ANA are negative, then usually what I would do is, or if we have the SP100 GP210 negative, I would usually get some imaging of the uh, MRC to be sure we're not missing PSC or some other uh, disease. Uh, and then if that's negative, go on to the liver biopsy to come to the diagnosis. Now, a term we often hear is this autoimmune cholangiopathy, and I'd recommend we avoid that term because I don't think we really have a good definition of what that means. And PBC, AMA negative PBC really is PBC. It acts very similarly or really identically uh, to AMA positive PBC, and so that's a term we should use in those cases that are AMA negative and avoid the term autoimmune cholangiopathy. Oops, there we go. So, and specifically about the AMA negative PBC patients, so about 20% of our patients will be AMA negative, and half of those will have a positive ANA. So about 10% of PBC patients will still be AMA negative, ANA negative, and will require a liver biopsy. And in general, the AMA negative uh, patients, as I mentioned, behave the same, though they may have a little bit more aggressive disease. The two other variant syndromes uh, are the overlap syndrome with autoimmune hepatitis and the so-called ductopenic variant. And the latter of these two is really rare, and um, 
I think I've seen maybe two cases in the last 20 years. These are patients that present with relatively little fibrosis, but very severe cholestasis, uh, very few bile ducts on their, um, on their biopsies and progress in the matter of a couple of years to cirrhosis and liver transplantation. There's not much we can do for them. The overlap syndrome is also, I think, quite rare, um, but is frequently diagnosed. I think it's important to recognize that in routine PBC, they frequently have anti-nuclear antibodies, as mentioned. They also have elevated, mild elevations of their transaminases, and they can have a little bit of interface hepatitis on their liver biopsies. So that by itself should not make a diagnosis of autoimmune hepatitis, because those patients will respond to URSO and in many cases do just fine. So the criteria that have been used most generally to make this diagnosis are quite high, and that's the so-called Paris criteria requiring two of the three following. That is an ALT five times the upper limit of normal, an IgG more than two times the upper limit of normal or the presence of an anti-smooth muscle antibody, and mild to severe interface hepatitis. You need two of those three things. So generally, if we had a patient that presented with PBC and their ALT was five times the upper limit of normal, those are the patients we might consider doing a liver biopsy in to confirm that they don't have or they do have overlap with autoimmune hepatitis. The reason this is important is because we don't want to be giving our patients immunosuppressants with they're not likely to have much benefit. So in general, if we are suspecting this overlap, I would start with URSO, see how they respond, um, be sure that they do have overlap before starting immunosuppressants because frequently, even with the addition of immunosuppressants, you're not going to have much of a benefit on um, their course. Now for the routine patient with PBC that we start on URSA, we've known for a long time now, over a decade, that those that have a complete biochemical response have a normal life expectancy. This is a study from France, now more than 10 years old or 10 years old, in which Patients that had this biochemical response had a normal life expectancy compared to the control population, whereas those that didn't have that response uh, did poorly. Uh, and these patients tend to be the younger women that present uh, with their disease, usually in their 40s, sometimes even in their 30s. Men also tend to have a less uh, robust response to URSO and, and progress more rapidly. And, and my personal experience and some data out of Miami suggests that Hispanic patients with PBC also don't respond as well uh, to URSO. Now, how we, res how we define biochemical response is one of the areas that's been fairly confusing because over the last several years, there have been multiple criteria. There was the Paris criteria, both one and two. There's the Barcelona criteria. Um, et cetera, et cetera, Toronto. Um, but what's become really clear, the two main factors that determine response uh, uh, or outcomes after treatment with URSO are the alkaline phosphatase and the bilirubin. In terms of the alkaline phosphatase, and these both relate to treatment after one year of URSO, if your alkaline phosphatase is above the upper limit of normal, the risk of liver transplantation or death continues to go up. And really it's when it's about one and a half or more times the upper limit of normal that you have a significant increase. In contrast, bilirubin actually interestingly goes up in terms of risk even before you hit one times the upper limit of normal. So at about 0.7 times the upper limit of normal, the risk starts going up with bilirubin. So even a normal bilirubin that's at the upper limit of normal should be a little cause of concern in our patients with PBC. What I like to use in clinic is this GLOBE score. This is a, a model based on a large number of PVC patients throughout the world and um, is a simple calculator in which you include age, bilirubin, alkaline phosphatase, albumin, platelets uh, after treatment with URSA for at least a year. And it gives you basically a score that if it's read tells you that they have a, a risk that is significantly greater than the control population, average population matched for sex and age uh, uh, it, given their current uh, treatment, whereas if it's green, uh, it shows that their risk of transplant-free survival uh, is consistent with that uh, of a control population. It goes out to 15 years. So it's very helpful both for making clinical decisions as well as discussing with your patients uh, their risk uh, of uh, their disease. For those patients that need another therapy, 
Uh, the only approved second line therapy is obeticolic acid or Ocaliva. Uh, and the results I'm showing here from the phase three POI study, which is a double blind randomized controlled trial comparing obeticolic acid at 10 milligrams daily uh, or a, a titration dose starting at five milligrams with the option of increasing to 10 milligrams uh, based on treatment and tolerability of the medication. The patients that enrolled in here were patients with PBC who had been treated with ERSO and still had an alkaline phosphatase more than 1.67 times the upper limit of normal, or about 200, or they were intolerant to ERSO. And the majority, more than 90%, were on ERSO. After one year of treatment, um, both treatment groups with the Ocaliva uh, uh, had a significantly greater response, so 47 and 46 percent, uh, and response was defined as reduction of the alkaline phosphatase below that 1.67 times the upper limit of normal with at least a 15 percent reduction uh, in the alkaline phosphatase in a normal bilirubin, uh, and that's compared to 10 percent in the placebo. Now, one of the uh, effect, side effects, the most common side effect of abeticolic acid is, is itching, um, and so that was seen in both groups. But I think it's important to recognize that with the titration uh, approach, only one patient discontinued abeticolic acid because of itch. So it tended to be well tolerated, and that's why it's recommended to start at five milligrams and then consider increasing based on tolerability and response, and usually we can uh, get patients to, to do well on it. Now, um, this, that was biochemical response, and one of the questions always is, uh, will that translate into uh, clinical benefit? And that's always a problem in our chronic liver diseases, whether that's NASH, PBC, or PSC, is how do we know if we're making things look better on paper, it's actually going to translate into an, a clinical benefit. And we're starting to get some information about abeticolic acid. This is data that was presented at the last easel meeting which is a sub-study of that POIS trial where patients were given an option of having a liver biopsy at baseline and then three years after treatment. And of the 13 patients that participated in this, the majority either had stable fibrosis or reduction in fibrosis after treatment. And there's more data that's being analyzed now that suggests that this is real, a real effect, uh, that uh, there, there does seem to be either stabilization or reduction of fibrosis with the treatment over long periods of time. <clears throat> Now, I would also like to point out there is a black, spot, black box warming for abeticolic acid for patients with decompensated cirrhosis. So if you have a child B or C patient uh, with PBC and you're thinking about using abeticolic acid, it needs to be dosed at five milligrams weekly, not daily, but weekly. And this is one of the issues where it was uh, uh, prescribed at the wrong dose for those patients. We don't have much information in decompensated cirrhosis with this drug and PBC. Uh, and there is a phase four study going on right now for these patients. So that's something to consider if you have a patient you're thinking about using obeticolic acid that's a decompensated cirrhosis, is think about enrolling them in a clinical trial for that specifically. So what about patients that either don't tolerate obeticolic acid or don't, don't qualify <clears throat> or it's not available for them? Are there any other options? And the new kit on the block right now are the fibrates. And there's really some limited data here to discuss, um, but I think it's, it's something that's interesting uh, and clearly being used uh, by some uh, practitioners. So fibrates were um, first used in, in Japan and later in Europe, particularly bezafibrate. Uh, and in uh, case series uh, seemed to have a very good response, a very uh, good at terms of actually potentially limiting uh, pruritus. And just this year in New England Journal of Medicine, uh, the first randomized controlled trial of bezafibrate was uh, published, and this was a study out of France. 50 patients were randomized to either bezafibrate or placebo, uh, and they looked for a complete uh, response, which was defined a little bit differently in that they had to have normalization of alkaline phosphatase, bilirubin, and other measures. And they got about a third of their patients having that complete biochemical response after two years of therapy. It seemed to be... Um, Quite, quite effective in terms of biochemical response. The one concern about bezafibrate, I would say the one major concern are, is the potential for hepatotoxicity. They had three patients that discontinued because of hepatotoxicity elevations of ALT uh, out of the 50, and also patient, one patient had an elevation of uh, the CK. Uh, so uh, this is something uh, still of concern, still needs more investigation, of course. For us, we don't have bezafibrate available. 
There is phenofibrate, for which there is very limited um, data in its use in PBC. Um, my experience, I've used it in a very limited number of patients, but that is, of course, off-label. And so um, we should be somewhat um, judicious in its use there, I think. There are other um, PPAR agonists being developed. We'll hear a little bit about Celadelpar with the next talk and its development, and then Elafibrinar is also being studied uh, in PBC. So um, more to come on PPARs. And then, believe it or not, despite the fact that there are so few PBC patients around, there are more trials going on probably than patients now, um, <clears throat> we have lots of therapies that are being developed. So. Um, other drugs that sort of work in the same mechanism as um, obeticolic acid are being developed, uh, the PPAR agonist I mentioned. There's an antifibrotic that's having some positive early results. And then PBC is this quintessential autoimmune disease, yet immunosuppressants have typically not worked in the past in its treatment, uh, uh, yet there are some uh, newer therapies that we are very hopeful may be effective in treating the underlying autoimmune reaction, and those are ongoing as well. So lots on the horizon for PBC in terms of treatment. But for now, what I would suggest is that um, we start with our typical ERSO, first-line therapy. The majority of our patients are going to have a complete biochemical response. They're going to continue to have their symptoms of fatigue, um, but their alkaline phosphatase will generally be in the lower range, if not normal. Their bilirubin will be normal. Uh, and they'll do just fine for a long period of time. That's usually about 60 to 70 percent of our patients. However, patients that even though they may be asymptomatic, if they don't have a complete biochemical response, we should really be thinking about second-line therapies. In addition, patients that are intolerant of ERSO, that's usually about 5 percent of patients. Uh, and those with advanced disease that may not have um, significantly elevated liver tests, we might also consider second-line therapies. For those patients, the first line, the only approved therapy is, again, obeticolic acid. We could consider fetofibrate off-label, and then clinical trials is another option. Okay. Let's take a swig of water, let you all take a minute to digest that, and we'll move on to PSC. <clears throat> so PSC is sort of the classic fibrotic disease of the, the large bile ducts, um, causing these uh, segmental strictures, of course, with more proximal dilation, uh, the t classic onion skinning, uh, fibrosis, uh, and its strong association with colitis. About 70% of our patients will have colitis. And it's interesting in that it's one of the few autoimmune conditions in which there's a male predominance. And while we think of this affecting primarily men in their 30s and 40s, in fact, it can affect almost any age group. We see it in kids, and increasingly we're seeing it in older adults as well. And if we break down PSC into its different sort of subphenotypes or, or, or groups, we can break it up into many different um, types. And this is why PSC is so difficult, I think, to, to understand and study, is that we can think about PSC in, in the uh, context of whether IBD is present or absent or the type of IBD, whether it's ulcerative colitis or Crohn's colitis, the age of onset, uh, whether it affects men or women, uh, whether there's overlap with autoimmune hepatitis, what types of strictures there are, small duct disease versus large duct disease. And also we have data that's coming out in terms of race and ethnicity. We often think about PSC affecting Caucasians but I'll show you some data on African Americans um, where we see that it uh, affects them as well and uh, may have a little bit different um, clinical presentation. So first of all, in terms of PSC um, and its diagnosis, the classic form that we all learned about in medical school is this large duct uh, PSC, we call it now. And this has a typical cholangiographic features. There are there obviously an absence of secondary causes uh, which can uh, present with similar uh, uh, cholangiograms, and it can be present with or without IBD. Just like in PBC, this overlap with autoimmune hepatitis has been reported uh, and um, probably exists, although there's no consensus in terms of which criteria we should use to make this diagnosis. And so again, I think we should be somewhat skeptical about this and really have solid evidence that there is autoimmune hepatitis overlapping the PSC. 
And the other confounder here is in PSC, we sometimes see patients that present with classic autoimmune hepatitis. We then treat them with immunosuppressants. They seem to respond just fine. But over time, they then get cholestatic, and they stop responding to immunosuppression. And then when you do your cholangiogram, you see they have a PSC-like picture. So whether that's like classic PSC or not, it's unclear, but those patients tend to progress as well. Um, and then finally, the small duct PSC variant uh, is another difficult diagnosis to quite try to define. Uh, and in fact, we're trying to do that now, and I, we can't quite get it right, I think. Um, these are patients, though, that present with a normal cholangiogram. And when we say normal cholangiogram, that's always a hard um, definition to come up with, too, because is it just an MRI, MRC, and what's the quality of that? So do we have to also have an ERC to show that it's normal? And I'm sure those of you in the room that do ERCPs will probably um, uh, argue that an ERCP is much better than an MRCP in terms of making uh, a diagnosis of, of PSC. But anyway, these are individuals that should have a normal cholangiogram, but on biopsy have kind of the typical sclerosing cholangitis histology, which while typical of PSC is not specific for PSC. And so I would say that in, when a patient has inflammatory bowel disease, a normal cholangiogram, but findings on histology typical of PSC, then that is likely a small duct PSC case. In the absence of IBD, we have to be concerned that there may be other causes, in particular genetic uh, deficiencies that can present with cholestasis and a similar uh, uh, finding on histology, in particular things like PFIC3, that while we think of them as being pediatric conditions, actually can present as adults. So something to keep in mind. Now, also important is any patient that we're considering to have a diagnosis of PSC, even if they have no symptoms of IBD, no history of IBD, we have to do a colonoscopy because the, the colitis of PSC often is very mild and right-sided and patients often are asymptomatic. This is a colonoscopy from a patient of mine, has the typical mild uh, colitis around the IC valve and the cecum and the, the proximal ascending colon, but more distally, completely normal colon. Um, and this has implications both in terms of helping you make the diagnosis of PSC as well as colon cancer screening in the future. Another diagnostic um, issue with PSC has to do with IgG4. And this is, a, I think, a very confusing issue, um, but one that we're starting to get some light on. Uh, so there is, of course, this new, newer entity of IgG4-associated cholangitis or igg 4 sclerosing cholangitis which is within the spectrum of autoimmune pancreatitis and other IgG4-related diseases in which serum IgG4 is elevated and there's infiltration of IgG4 secreting plasma cells in the tissue. Uh, both in PSC as well as the IAC, cholangiograms look very similar, so distinguishing them uh, is impossible really just by uh, imaging techniques. And what confounds this is the fact that about 5 to 15% of PSC patients also have an elevated IgG4. So how do you separate these two things out? Um, there's a nice study out of the Netherlands and UK um, which looked at a large number of patients with PSC and IAC to uh, differentiate these two. Uh, and there's a, a clear distinction if the... Um, uh, IgG4 is over 5.8, that this is clearly going to be IgG4-related, uh, IgG4 uh, cholangitis, uh, whereas if it's under um, uh, 1 point, uh, 2, I should say uh, 2.8, then it's uh, sort of uh, uh, intermediate, and if it's below 1.4, then it's clearly going to be uh, PSC. And so what they've proposed is the following algorithm, that is if the IgG4 is less than 1.4, you can feel confident, confident that it's PSC, whereas if it's 1.4 to 2.8 uh, or 2.8 to even uh, uh, 5.8, that it could be either of the two, and we should be thinking about um, doing uh, biopsy uh, or um, considering cholangiocarcinoma. They also suggest that the ratio of IgG4 to IgG1 um, can help make this distinction, but oftentimes we don't have the IgG1 uh, to compare that to. But I think for the most part, we can feel confident if our IgG4 is less than 1.4 that this is truly PSC and not 
um, IgG4-associated cholangitis. Now, in terms of the progression of PSC and its prognostication, the majority of patients still progress to either liver transplantation or have liver-related deaths, shown here in these multiple studies in the blue bars uh, and orange bars. It's important to recognize, though, that in addition to the progression of the liver disease, about 10 to 20 percent of patients will um, die from PSC-related cancers. And in fact, in some studies, that's a leading cause of mortality among PSC patients now. And those cancers, of course, are cholangiocarcinoma, um, the majority of which actually, or, or the large percentage of which, are diagnosed in the first year uh, of diagnosis of their PSC. After that, the annual incidence is about 1% per year. Uh, and um, so we have to have quite high vigilance or high um, suspicion during the first year of diagnosis. They also have high rates of gallbladder cancer. And um, if they have a, a, a nodule on their gallbladder, then we should have a low threshold for performing cholecystectomy. In addition, they, have, of course, have a high risk of colon cancer. Um, it's increased even compared to those with ulcerative colitis that occurs earlier, uh, it tends to be right-sided, and so surveillance is recommended to start at the time of diagnosis and not waiting for that eight-year duration of their, their uh, inflammatory bowel disease before starting surveillance. There are, of course, also infectious complications, um, particularly those associated with dominant strictures, um, which are... Uh, associated with reduced transplant-free survival, and then also bacterial cholangitis uh, that we know very little about, but at least in terms of patients that are listed for liver transplantation, that's quite common, but interestingly, it's, it was not associated with increased uh, removal or death uh, on the, the wait list. Um, so generally, um, a difficult and challenging uh, complication in many patients, but fortunately rarely leads to um, mortality. Now, when we have our patients in clinic, one of the questions with a new diagnosis always is, what is their life expectancy, um, particularly when we're dealing with our younger patients? And in the past, uh, it was fairly grim, and it still is not um, all roses. But uh, it has become quite clear that if you look at liver transplant centers, not surprisingly where most of the data came from, the median survival was only about 12 to 15 years. But increasingly, we've seen that in non-transplant centers, that median survival is over 20 years. These are two different studies, one from the Netherlands and one from Israel, um, whereas this study from the International PSC Study Group, which is the largest one to date, um, includes mainly specialized center, and, and so it typically has the 15-year survival. This is some data we uh, published from uh, a patient registry where patients self-reported their disease and um, outcomes, um, and it was uh, done by a patient advocacy group called PSC Partners, which I recommend you refer your patients to for information. It's outstanding. Um, and they similarly had a 20-year median survival, transplant-free survival. So I think we have pretty good data that rather than being that 12 to 15 years, it's more, than, it's more like 20 to, to more. Um, uh, years in terms of median transplant-free survival. Now, of course, there's quite variability there um, in terms of how uh, uh, the patients, uh, how long patients will go before transplant. And there have been models we've used in the past, uh, particularly the Mayo uh, risk score, to try to prognosticate how patients might do. And the PSC model for the Mayo PSC model was good for the, like a four-year window. So it told us that patients that were sick were going to do poorly. It was based mainly on bilirubin, albumin, and variceal bleeding. So I think we all know that if someone has a variceal bleed, they're not going to do well. Um, so those patients that are, have milder disease are their better models we can use. And just this year, two models uh, were um, published from the Mayo Group, this Presto model, and then from Amsterdam and Oxford, their own model. And they pretty much used the same measures. They've added a few others. Um, that may give us a little bit more information, but they're still somewhat limited in terms of um, prognostication and the window in which we can um, really uh, advise our patients and, and give them some meaningful information. So still a, an area of some, some need, um, but there are a couple models just to bring your attention to. The next set of uh, information I want to go over 
uh, comes from this international PSC study group, which um, uh, was published in uh, Gastro about a year ago. And this was retrospective data collected over 30 years from 37 centers throughout the world, included 7, 000, over 7,000 patients uh, and almost 600 cholangiocarcinomas. Uh, and what the study did was look at factors that were associated both with transplant-free survival as well as uh, incidence of um, hepatobiliary ca cancers, primarily cholangiocarcinoma. And the four factors that really came out were sex, ducts, age, and the presence or type of IBD. So I just want to run through these briefly to, to highlight some of these uh, factors that I think will be helpful for you. So age of diagnosis turned out to be a pretty important factor for transplant-free survival, not too surprisingly. So the older age you were diagnosed, the more likely, the greater your risk um, for death or liver transplantation, and also for the risk of cholangiocarcinoma. So diagnosis at an older age led to a higher risk of cholangiocarcinoma. And if you'll see down here, the blue line Patients diagnosed under the age of 20 had very low rates of cholangiocarcinoma, and that's been seen in the pediatric literature also. So I think that is, should inform us in terms of whether we do um, surveillance for cholangiocarcinoma, uh, particularly in this younger group. And this data in terms of transplant-free survival was um, validated in a large pediatric uh, group from the Pediatric PSC Consortium. Shown here in the red line is their data overlying the data from the International PSC Study Group showing very similar transplant-free survival. The other important factor is the type of uh, uh, PSC. So if we break it up into small duct PSC, overlap, and classic PSC, and I should say small duct PSC and overlap, were, these diagnoses were just um, assigned by the investigator with no specific uh, definitions given. But those defined as small duct PSC did much better uh, compared to overlap and classic PSC, and surprisingly, the overlap did slightly better than the classic PSC. And interestingly, when we look at uh, cholangiocarcinoma, those with overlap had less cholangiocarcinoma uh, than the classic, as well as the small duct PSC doing much better as well. IBD is also an important area where those with Crohn's disease tend to do better than those with ulcerative colitis, indeterminate colitis, or no colitis in terms of transplant-free survival. And then in terms of hepatobiliary malignancy, there are some differences, but it's not significant enough to really alter um, our practice. Finally, um, women tend to do slightly better than men, both in terms of survival as well as risk of cholangiocarcinoma. So another group that we're finding, and um, you may see in your practice, uh, are African Americans with PSC. And, and this was sort of brought to light, um, you know, the classic kind of patient with PSC we think about is, you know, this person over here, this is Chris Klug, who um, was an Olympic snowboarder. But we should also remember that Walter Payton died of cholangiocarcinoma associated with PSC. And when we looked at the uh, uh, transplant listings, um, for PSC, we found that about 6% of, of African Americans listed for uh, liver transplantation in the United States were listed with a diagnosis of PSC, which is a similar percentage of whites. And more recently, David Goldberg at the University of Pennsylvania did a study where um, we reported on the percentage of African Americans in our PSC population relative to the general population we served, and we saw that there was a direct correlation. That is, if you have a large African American population uh, that you're serving, then you're going to have a, a larger percentage in your PSC population. Uh, so again, suggesting that this is not uncommon uh, in African Americans. However, they do have a slightly different clinical phenotype. What we see in African Americans is a slightly lower rate of inflammatory bowel disease and mainly due to a lower rate of ulcerative colitis. And we also don't see this male predominance. It tends to be equally distributed between men and women. I'd also say that in the UNOS data, we see that they're listed at a younger age and with more advanced disease or at least a higher MELD score, suggesting that they have a worse uh, presentation, worse disease. So this is an area of interest and, and something we should keep in mind as we see our patients and not think just because they're African-American, they can't have this disease. 
Um, I just want to touch a, a minute on um, uh, elastography in PSC. This is a tool that's uh, being used. It may be helpful in your clinic. It's, it's I'm sure, available to all of you. Uh, like most diseases, it really goes up later uh, in the disease. So there is a definite correlation uh, between biopsy stage and liver stiffness, so there's a lot of overlap. Um, and there's an ongoing study to look at this prospectively in PSC. Not surprisingly, uh, patients with a higher liver stiffness do, do worse uh, than those with lower liver stiffness. And one of the things we're using at UC Davis, and you may have available to you, is MR elastography. This is a, a similar uh, technology to fiber scan, but it allows you to sample a larger part of the liver and may have benefits in PSC where there's real regional variation in terms of the fibrosis that's occurring. And if you're getting an MRI on your patients anyway, um, if you can add it, it may be helpful in terms of uh, prognostication and, and seeing how much fibrosis is, is present. So treatment in PSC, unfortunately, there's not a lot to talk about um, with treatment in PSC. Um, hopefully in five to 10 years, we'll have lots of therapies because it is an active uh, area of investigation. First thing though is the, what we're dealing with today is do we use Urso or not? And my opinion on this has changed and it changes on a daily basis almost. Um, so we know that it, you know, it's been studied extensively both here and, and in Europe. Uh, and generally, they've all been negative studies. We know that at the very high doses of 28 to 30 milligrams per kilogram daily, it's detrimental. We definitely shouldn't be doing that. But at lower doses, it does seem to improve liver biochemistries, though there's no evidence that it improves outcomes. Um, vancomycin, I don't know how much vancomycin um, you use here or patients ask for it here. Um, in Northern California, we're, um, we're very close to Stanford where this data comes from in pediatrics. Um, there's a real push, um, particularly by parents, um, to have their kids on vancomycin. And there's really limited data here. Uh, this is the data in the kids from Stanford just showing improvements in liver biochemistries. Uh, in a case series, they have some histology data. There's ongoing uh, studies on this, and there is a planned uh, adult study uh, that Keith Linder's running, uh, sponsored by the FDA, uh, which should be starting soon, so hopefully we can have some uh, uh, answers regarding vancomycin, but n definitely not something I would recommend uh, at this time. And this is just an adult, uh, a very small study suggesting some improvement in liver biochemistries from the Mayo. I'll skip that. So what, what do we have so far uh, that's in the pipeline that might be available in the next few years? So the, the lead compound right now is this nor Urso. It's like Urso, but has certain properties that allows it to undergo uh, 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 cholehepatic circulation as opposed to intrahepatic uh, uh, circulation, which may have some benefits in terms of protecting the bile ducts. These results from a double-blind placebo-controlled phase two study uh, and it looks like it's going to be going into phase three study in Europe, uh, but not in the United States. <clears throat> there also have been some phase two uh, trial results published recently, including those from obeticolic acid, here just showing again improvements in alkaline phosphatase uh, at different doses, uh, up to 24 weeks. Uh, and then interestingly, there's this compound called NGM282, which kind of works on the same pathway as obeticolic acid, which didn't, it, it did not improve the alkaline phosphatase. This is the, the um, uh, placebo baseline versus uh, end of treatment uh, in two different doses, no difference in alkaline phosphatase, which has kind of been our biomarker. Um, but what it did do was improve markers of fibrosis, which is really what we want to do. So one of the problems we have with these clinical trials is what does response mean? What does improvement mean? We don't have those markers that we do in PBC. Um, so whether this goes forward or not, I think is unclear. But what we do have are a number of studies. So we have the obeticolic acid, we have norurso, we have NGM282, we have this um, Gilead compound. All had positive phase two uh, study results and maybe going on to phase three. And then we have another number of other therapies and others li not listed here that are being looked at. So while we don't have treatment for um, PSC right now, hopefully we will in the very near future. So just sort of a practical approach, should you start Urso, you might offer it to them, 
Um, if it improves, continue it. It's probably not doing any harm, but if it doesn't improve, I'd really suggest referring them to a clinical trials because those are will be available soon. In terms of management of malignancy, um, I do recommend uh, considering surveillance uh, for adults with large duct PSC, um, although I admit the evidence is weak. Usually uh, I try to alternate an MRI and ultrasound every six months um, and get a CA-199, though again, um, the evidence on that is, is somewhat weak. Uh, but I do have a low threshold for bile duct sampling. I don't recommend routine ERCP for surveillance, um, and I think that's not being done too frequently anymore. Uh, and again, gallbladder polyps um, should uh, be considered for cholecystectomy, particularly in those with early uh, stage liver disease, and, and surveillance with colonoscopy for those with IBD. So just to wrap it up, uh, the take home messages here, I would say in terms of PBC, consider testing for SP100 and GP210 before doing a biopsy. If you have a suspected AMA negative PBC patient, you might avoid a couple biopsies. Um, be very skeptical about that overlap syndrome and um, really reserve the immunosuppressants for those that clearly have overlap. Um, and don't settle for uh, incomplete biochemical response in your patients, even if they're asymptomatic. They're going to progress over time and do need second-line therapies. In terms of PSC, again, be skeptical of that overlap syndrome as well as the small duct PSC. Um, you can consider URSA um, uh, or, you know, hopefully clinical trials for their treatment uh, and consider surveillance for their malignancy since that's going to be one of the leading causes of death in these patients. Thank you very much.